between 97 and 2007, uh, there's been you know, a very bad inflow, uh, inflow year, and therefore the matching outflow has been also very low. But if you took the next one, this shows data between 97 to 2007, and you can see that in the month of October, we have got very high uh, withdrawal from the river, and that is consistent across many years. Right? And in the month of February, for instance, you will see every February the water level is so low that there's absolutely no water to withdraw. So the question for us was, if this is how you can withdraw water from the Kabini, how are you going to make a thermal power plant, which has a consistent demand of water? You cannot say, I will withdraw water in October and store it somewhere, like you store coal, for instance. You can't store water unless you build a dam. And you can't build a dam because Tamil Nadu will not allow that so easily, right? And yet a decision was taken to site a thermal power plant. And if you take the uh, same thing in a bar diagram, what we find is the actual utilization of water for summer crops is far lower, except in one or two years, it's far lower than what is estimated. So farmers are sold the promise that there is water for you coming in summer from Kabini. But that's never re really delivered. So there is no water for farming, there is really no water for drinking, therefore, because Kabini is the river which services the drinking water needs of the Mysore and towns around Mysore, Nanjungut, for instance. You see? So large settlements depend on the Kabini for drinking water needs. We don't have water for drinking, we don't have water for agriculture, but somehow 3.9 TMC of water was promised for the thermal power plant. The Electricity Regulatory Commission understood this point and made this submission the determining factor as a result of which the power plant was disallowed. They did not have the power to reject the proposal, but they recommended strongly to the Karnataka government. And of course, there was a massive movement, a groundswell of opposition against the power plant. And uh, eventually, the project was abandoned in 2008. The reason why I'm sharing this is because for the first time, we actually used... There is, yeah. there is a community dam. There is a community dam which was built a long time ago. You couldn't dam further if you want to augment the sub storage situation to support the... the you, you can dam it technically. Point is, Tamil Nadu will object. And then it will go before the river authority and it might go to the Supreme Court. You know, between 91 and 20, two, uh, 2007, it took 17 years to come to some sort of a you know, decision. So if you... Prop in fact, uh, if I just go back, if you... Look at the drinking water needs of Bangalore. Uh, it's a very big issue in Karnataka. For uh, its slides are moving. Lit. Yeah. The stage five of Kaveri does not exist. But just before the Kaveri crosses into Tamil Nadu, a huge reservoir is proposed at a place called Mekedatu, uh, which is where the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary is a really beautiful forest area. And uh, that's where the Arkavati meets the Kaveri. And then it flows into Meturu Dam. That's the last point at which you can dam the river in Karnataka. A huge dam coupled with 500 megawatts of electric hydropower generation is promoted, proposed by Karnataka, uh, I think about a decade ago, and consistently it comes up. So Karnataka wants to build not only this dam to augment, uh, augment the drinking water needs of Bangalore, but it also wants to divert Netravati. Netravati is a west flowing river flowing towards the coast. And they want to tunnel through the Western Ghats and bring the Netravati towards the east to ensure that Bangalore and a neighboring district called Kolar get drinking water. So such is the crisis, and it is very easy to politicize it. It's like you know, striking a match and throwing it on a haystack. It will ignite. <coughs> so it's a very volatile uh, uh, situation when you talk about Kaveri. I mean, there are, of course, uh, uh, so the question that we want to ask is, if you want to look at the future of this river, is it at all possible to imagine a future living of a living Kaveri, of a Kaveri which you actually see flowing uh, and in a healthy state, if we were to have this kind of model of development, such intense urbanization, such in intense uh, industrialization, and of course we have not spoken so much about the extraction for agriculture, but the basic point remains that uh, the dispute between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu basically has been that uh, Tamil Nadu has irrigated much larger areas by using the Kaveri, and Karnataka has not got a fair share of the Kaveri waters. 
and therefore that matter keeps on becoming a very strong political issue between the two states. Uh, I'll stop here uh, and then discuss the issue. We have a small interview with the farmer. We'll take it up later. Yeah. So basically they're saying the Rishabhavati is so toxic that if they touch the water, they get blisters. It's like acid, they say. And they found uh, dead bodies, they find, you know, you can imagine the, the muck that is flowing down the Rishabhavati. Uh, even biomedical waste is dumped, toxic uh, effluents from industries. <laughs> The stench is horrendous. Uh, I mean, you can't. Uh, the, the river, f uh, the Vishavati flows uh, for almost 45, 50 kilometers before it merges with the Kaveri. And you can travel down 20, 30 kilometers despite the fact that it goes through very rocky terrain. And therefore, there's a possibility of agitating it and bringing down, uh, you know. BOD and COD and so on, uh, it still doesn't work. It stings for about 30, 40 kilometers. Uh, uh, so you, a large volume of the city's waters are going. So that when the city intensifies its development and other cities join in, all of that will be drained into the Kaveri system. And really, you know, what we are sending into uh, Tamil Nadu is not such pure waters at all. <laughs> So, just to give a sense of what happens eventually in that interview, is that they share that uh, the health of everyone who lives ar around that lake, which is Bairamangla, has been affected. People are perpetually suffering one or the other fever. They don't know which fever. So that man said, you know, the mosquito problem is really bad. And they have, uh, he was talking about everyone. I mean, he doesn't know anybody who has not suffered from chikungunya there. Uh, malaria is quite, uh, uh, you know, prevalent in that region. Uh, and there is a general uh, morbidity in the population. Uh, children are perpetually sick. Uh, farmers who work in the paddy fields, which are f fed by these waters, most of them have skin ailments. And the tragedy of it is that, you know, we are not very far away in the sense that we are consumers of the vegetables they grow. And that vegetable is ba sold ba uh, back in Bangalore. In fact, one of the things that I do is I ask them, where did you get the vegetables from? Or I smell the vegetables to find out if it is grown in those super waters. It's come to that, right? You can't just trust the vegetables that you eat in Bangalore anymore. Uh, and if you thought you could br bring vegetables from the north of Bangalore, now that is also not possible because the northern tank systems have all also been polluted. So. The city was the horticultural center of India. Mm -hmm. And today the tragedy is that these toxic waters are destroying the diversity of crops and vegetables and fruits. None of the orchards, in fact, uh, the uh, opening shot that Bhargavi showed of Rishabhavati, you see coconut trees falling. You know, coconut is a very resilient tree, right? But you never see it falling and toppling over. But we just don't find the coconut trees yielding the number, of the type of fruits which it would before. And you, you, they go on to describe that agriculture is impossible. Uh, fishing, which was a very important livelihood uh, support system there. People fish, but none of them who live around here eat that fish. Uh, we have seen study, we have uh, got studies by various universities in Bangalore which shows that the lead levels in the, uh, um, uh, you know, the m muzzles of the fish, there is bioaccumulation that is taking place. Lead, chromium, copper, uh, very high loads of uh, uh, heavy metals which is accumulating in the fish stock. Uh, so it is entering our food cycle. So 
The problem is we don't find the regulatory agencies seeing this as a problem. It's being reported. Uh, in fact, there was another report which just, just came out about three weeks ago by the drought, mo drought monitoring cell. They went and surveyed the groundwater uh, in this belt and they found it is very heavily contaminated. But it has not become a problem in terms of how you think of a river system, right? Uh, and uh, I just I was, I was in Salem just three days ago talking to some friends who are farmers there. For them, this water that we send has become such a deeply problematic issue. In addition to the industrial waste that is dumped into the Kaveri there, they are now planning to mobilize farmers on the issue of polluted waters being received from Karnataka. In not, not just the fact that we are getting water, but you are sending us polluted waters. So this should not be the future of the Kaveri. That's the point we are trying to make. I mean, Kaveri can have a different imagination. Uh, it is a living river. In fact, what is surprising is this. Uh, if you uh, actually study the water quality after the polluted Arkavati, Vrishabhavati Arkavati, joined the Kaveri, within six kilometers, because of the f you know, fresh flow, inflow from the Kaveri River, the waters get miraculously cleaned up. And, not, and it's not a miracle, really, because it goes through a fantastic gorge at Mekedatu. The river dives down at Meke Datu and then jumps again at Ogenekul Falls. Right? All this helps in increasing the oxygen levels in the water and cleaning up the river. Right? So there is a possibility of avoiding the mess that we are in. It, it's, it's, it doesn't require too much intelligence. It really requires a lot of administrative and political willpower. And if that is absent, I think there is also methods uh, which we can force them to come to that stage. Right? And uh, you know, based on your questions, we'll share one example of how we have actually done that in the in protecting the tank systems around Bangalore. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> before I throw the matter over to interventions from the floor, may I ask you a question? See, you mentioned two different factors earlier. One was the kind of developmental pattern that we have adopted. The other was a question of corruption, criminality, and so on. Now, suppose the corruption did not exist. Would this problem still have been there? How much of it is due to that kind of uh, you know, mm. factor, which is not necessarily you know, a characteristic of development? Yeah. And how much of it, is, it arises out of the kind of development itself? I think that's a, that goes to the core of the problem, really. Uh, if you were to be an environmental engineer in the Pollution Control Board, the minimum bribe you pay to get the job now, it used to be three years ago or four years ago, five lakhs. Okay. The question you ask is, if you can invest five lakhs to get a job in the Pollution Control Board, what is your waiting period? Waiting period is not more than two or three years because you have drawn the money from somewhere and invested it. So you have to recover that five lakhs. And this is across the board. There are very few people who are engineers within the Pollution Control Board you can talk to who will express with honesty what is the, the state of the problem. So we know the problem. We have seen that the regulatory agencies from 1974, I mean the Water Act came in 1974, uh, and the Pollution Control Board was probably set up a few, a few years later. For the last 30 years, if you have not fixed what is a known problem, right? I think there is something, uh, you can't clean up a river if you can't fix that problem. But we have also learned that uh, by utilizing you know, innovative methods uh, through campaigns and litigations and so on, you can actually fix the problem. Uh, so I think corruption plays a major role in, in the fact that we see our rivers in this state. Uh, put it in a different way, if you were to look at the Pinya industrial area, and we have worked with many industries there, it's only when you know that an engineer is coming to check your effluent treatment plant that they turn it on. It's a universal problem. It's not just limited to Bangalore. It's the same in Chennai. It's the same in Bombay. It could be the same in Delhi. right? So we cannot escape this problem by relying on engineers of the regulatory system any further. What we are pushing for now is community monitoring. Every factory has to be monitored by the local community. It's in your interest to do that. 
then the engineer can pay his five lakhs. He may not get it back in three years at all, because you are forcing the industry to turn on its CTP and make it function. It works. There are many industries which are forced to do that. Uh, the other thing that we are now forcing is how can we turn neighborhoods into regions which do not contaminate. Uh, a new policy is to actually try and use the flow of the water through constructed wetlands and not go for expensive treatment plants and reduce the amount of uh, uh, waste, uh, what, what is called waste is really nutrients flowing into live river systems. Okay, so you increase the dissolved oxygen and this is easy uh, in an highly undulating terrain that Bangalore is. It may be a little more difficult if it's flat terrain, right? So we find that these kind of uh, solutions exist. But the fact that we are not able to make the solution part of the formal system is really the uh, missing link. And if you, I think with creative input from citizens and networks and so on, uh, in the next five, ten years, that is really going to be the work we need to do. I'm not sure if this yeah. gives a sense of... Well, it's open to the floor now.